Thank you very much, Norrin. I want to thank everyone. People have been tremendously gracious to me, and it's just absolutely wonderful to be here, even though my name's changed a few times. <laughs> I want to talk to you about something that is very important to me, and that is school. It is very easy to be critical of school when you don't have to go and talk about things, but at least in America, and I'm sure where you are, for the most part, children, teenagers, have to go to school. And since that's going to be true for at least uh, a number of years, what we have to take a look at is then what is the environment of school? What is it about school that we send our sons and daughters? Because um, as someone who has been both a dad and now a grandfather, what I can tell you is children love to learn. They get excited about anything that they didn't know before. But somehow, as they spend time in school, that doesn't always continue. That, that excitement of learning something new turns into, like, who cares? And I care. You care. And we need to take a look at uh, what, what schools are about. Now, it should be that students who are very intelligent gifted students, school should be their playground. School should be where they succeed. Okay? What I want to talk about is a, a number of students who are very bright, who are gifted, but their school experience is not one of success, and we're going to call them underachievers. Now, the work that I've done is taken a look at bright students who do not get good grades in school. Because grades are one of the ways that we measure whether you're doing well in school. Now, you can say grades aren't everything. Fine. Okay? But grades are something. Grades are still very important. Everybody kind of knows their mark and so forth. And so that's what I'm taking a look at specifically because grades are a, a measure of performance. The other thing I need to let you know uh, in my background is I was both a teacher in um, secondary schools. I was, I was a, a history teacher. And then I got my doctorate in counselor education. So I'm both a teacher and a counselor. And honestly, when it comes to giftedness, okay, so many times people are impressed by the gifted, by the gift by the talent, and they forget the human element behind it. To me, it's always been much more important about the person rather than gift. To develop talent, honestly, is very, very simple, if we could do it in the abstract. What makes talent development a challenge, what makes it rich, what makes it contradictory is that talent happens to live in a human body of a boy or a girl. And that's what makes it, uh, as I said, both rich and often very difficult. Okay, whenever we talk about achievement, you know, we've talked about overachievement, we can talk about underachievement, it's always a mismatch between what you think someone can do or what a test says that someone should do and then whether they do it or not. So if the expectation is here, and your performance is here, we don't call you an underachiever. We don't call you, we figure you're doing about what we expect, okay? So there's always the reality of, a, of an expectation. Now, one of the great ways to reduce underachievement is lower your expectation. That's not fair, okay? So how do we come around to these mismatches, okay? Some of the typical mismatches is an ability score, like cognitive abilities test, or some kind of an IQ test, and then a performance score. So like you have an IQ score that puts you in the top 3%, and then you have an achievement test score that puts you in about the 70th percentile. And you would say, something's wrong here. How can you be that smart here and not doing so well? There must be some kind of an underachievement. Most of our underachievement comes because of maybe standardized test scores, okay? 
but then also grades. So if you have a standardized test score that puts you in the top two or three percent, but your grades, and I don't know if, you know, we have like A, B, C, A being the best, so if your grade is like a C, we figure something's wrong. You're in the top three percent in the nation here, and you're just getting a C here, so you're underachieving. Now, what, what's going on? Actually, the reality of many schools, it's what the teacher also believes. So there are many teachers, they get to know the students, and they say, I know this girl can do a lot better. I know this boy can do a lot better, and they're not. You're not going to fool me. You're much smarter than you're pretending to be. And so we would consider that person uh, an underachiever because the teacher says he's not doing nearly what he can. And sometimes the parents are also that way, that they say, look, my son is not a C student. My son can do much better. Okay? And sometimes they're right, sometimes maybe not. But that's how we determine underachievement. And then there's also sometimes when the students themselves, a very bright student will say, you know, I know I can do better. I'm just not willing to do it. Okay? Usually that's not a, a, a big thing. It's the, the middle two with the standardized test and, and the teacher. Okay, so we're going to talk about achievement. Before I get to underachievement, that's the heart of my talk. I want to talk about, just for a brief moment, overachievement. Has anyone here in the audience ever been accused of, or you've heard yourself referred to as an overachiever? Has that ever happened to anybody? Don't lie to me, okay? It is amazing how many people have gone through schools and consider themselves, somebody said, you're an overachiever, All right? This is your very fortunate day that you came here because I'm going to let you know that you were lied to all your life. There is no such thing as being an overachiever because if you did it, you did it. The only reason to be an overachiever is that someone misdiagnosed or misapprehended what you were capable of. However, instead of saying, hmm, I misunderstood what you're capable of, we decide to blame the victim and say, you're an overachiever. Okay? There is no such thing. You cannot do what you're not capable of doing. Now, being an overachiever is also a very, very bad compliment. Because if someone says you're an overachiever, you never can relax. Because what it says, I'm not really that smart, I just work so hard. And what I have found in my discussions with those that have been called overachievers is they never really trust themselves. Because an overachiever is a backhanded compliment. Okay? So, let's just be fair to one another. If you ever see one of your students and you think that that girl or that boy is an overachiever, stop right now. Don't ever consider someone an overachiever because that doesn't exist. It is your problem. You are misunderstanding. And if you label them overachievers, they will have also this problem into adulthood that they're never really right. Now, I wish I could say the same thing about underachievement. I wish I could say it is impossible to do less than you're capable of. Take my word for it. It is very possible to do less than you're capable of. And that's what we're dealing with in terms of underachievement. How is it that you can have a capacity up here, but the performance is none? Now, I want to be clear. All children teenagers, adults, have their off days. It is possible not to do well in something. You don't like this subject. You know, you really like math, but you don't like literature or something. And so you do well one and the other. Those are, Jim Delisle considers non-producers. That, you know, they're temporary. They're, they're specific areas. You just don't do well. 
That's not what I'm talking about. All underachieving is a much more sustained issue, and it's one where you see school as a place where you do not want to do your best. So if you have a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, that's being a non-producer. It's not underachievement. The reasons, as we study underachievers, there's many reasons why bright students underachieve, but the outcome is always the same, and that is that the performance is well below what it could have been. Okay? So, what are some reasons why a gifted student... Now, you don't have to be gifted in school to underachieve. But that's the group that we're talking about. We're talking about those who have very, very high capacity, have been identified as gifted, but don't, don't do very well. All right. So one is environment, right. curriculum and so forth. And I will take each one with you. OK, the environment. I don't know how it is here, but I have a feeling I'm going to be accurate about this. But I can tell you in the United States, in school, if you are a great hockey player, if you are a great football player, that is not a problem. Nobody dislikes you because you're a great athlete. It's only when you are intellectually gifted that it raises some problems. So societies tend to appreciate certain things they're very comfortable with, other things not as comfortable. If you're really good in music, uh, if you're really good in art, if you're really good in athletics, that's usually not a problem. The problem is always intellectual ability because somehow it raises some questions in people that if you are really smart, you may be making others feel bad. And so it, that the cleanliness that you have in athletic ability, you don't have uh, with intellectual. And it's called anti-intellectualism. And I've written some articles about this, that, that as a nation, we just don't trust intellectual talent the way we do s some other areas. Same thing with, you know, with society. I think what you have to ask yourself is, what does your society really cherish? What, does everyone feel good about? What are some things that, that they're mixed feelings about? Okay, schools. There's been some studies done in the United States about the teenage culture. What do teenagers appreciate of one another and, and so forth? And what they found is that in America's schools, it is okay to be intelligent as long as you're athletic and as long as you don't work hard. So if you don't work hard in school, and you're athletic, and you're bright, you're OK. okay? No problem with your peer group. Your peer group means other teenagers. Okay? But what if you are smart, you work hard in school, and you're not athletic? That becomes a severe problem. Okay? And this has come out a number of times. Now remember, you and I, at least some of you, you and I are not teenagers. So some of the things that we appreciate, some of the things that we see, because okay, I haven't been a teenager for like five or six years now. You know, <laughs> some of the things I understand, but gifted kids who are teenagers have to live in an environment that is not as understanding as the way we are. And that's why it's so important for teachers to understand, because the teacher can become the savior, can become the, 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 the safety net in an environment that is not easy to understand. That doesn't mean that the other teenagers are mean. What it means is that they're young, they don't know much more, and that there are issues in growing up. And boy, in schools, uh, being smart is not always a smart thing to be. Gifted education. We have a number of students in the United States. I don't know if it's true here. We have a number of students who are selected for gifted programs but choose not to participate because they don't want to be identified. They don't want to be known 
to their other friends. So they actually say no. Okay? Now, imagine if a, if a student has been accepted to play on a select football or hockey team, and they say, no, no, I don't want my friends to know I'm on a select team. Pretty rare that that would happen, okay? But it happens in, in um, gifted education. The other thing by gifted education is just because you give it the label gifted education doesn't mean it's really a program for gifted. Many times, at least in the United States, the programs for gifted are just a label. They don't really do anything very, very different. And that's a problem, okay? A curriculum for gifted students should be such that if a student is not gifted, they would not want to participate. But if everybody can benefit, then why would you keep anybody out? And a number of programs feel good, they, they do nice things, but anybody could have done it. So why separate them? Okay? But if a program is for accelerated math or accelerated physics, and you can't do that, you will be the first one to say, I don't want to be in there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So always take a look at what a program is about. And then in terms of, uh, you know, as I said, lack of acceleration opportunities. Yesterday I spoke about acceleration. It's no secret that I do a lot of research on acceleration. Not everybody likes it, okay? But it is the one area that is almost, almost 100% appropriate for gifted students. And usually, it's not appropriate for other students. Curriculum, okay? There's something we can learn from coaches. I've been a coach. So can you imagine this, a coach saying, if you want to see the best in my players, you bring on a really poor team. Because when the opposition is poor, my students shine. Okay? Coaches don't say that. What they'll say is, if you want to see the best in my players, you bring on a team that will really challenge them and push them to do their best. And then you will see the best in my players. And that's the same way with curriculum. If you want to see the best in your gifted students, you have to bring on a curriculum that really challenges them, that makes them passionate. If you bring on a curriculum well below them, you're not bringing out the best in them. I don't know if you're familiar with ITBS. It sounds like a car. Uh, it's the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. It's one of the most used tests in the United States. So I'm going to give you an example. I've, I, was, see, I was dean for a number of years, and the Iowa Test of Basic Skills is developed in our College of Education. Finally, as dean, I had access to all the answers. I wish I would have had access when I was about 10 years old, because then I could have been highly, highly gifted. So I got the answers much later. But what I'm going to show you This is an example of one item on the fifth grade, year five, Iowa Test the Basic Skills, okay? And this is what's considered about an average item. And this is the beginning of fifth grade, so you haven't done fifth grade yet, okay? Now, don't shout out the answer. I got it the second time through. Okay, so this is what we would expect a fifth grader to eventually learn. This is an eighth grade test, what's considered a medium item. Right. Now, with gifted students in our talent searches, they take this eighth grade test. go back. And for the most part, fifth grade uh, gifted students do better 
on the eighth grade test than America's eighth graders. Okay? So think about this. You're in fifth grade, talented. You, you already know, uh, this, in this case, math, the eighth grade math before you, and yet you're in, stranded in fifth grade with that hundred. Okay? Do you see what I'm trying to show? That it's possible to have mismatches between what you're ready for and what you're going to get. Okay? I did a study of Iowa students, and Iowa students are pretty, pretty good in, in, in schools. And I took a look at the fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. And see, they take the Iowa Test of Basic Skills every year. And what we found with the Iowa students, and they're probably no different than the students in California and New York, what we found is that before they even, that most of the students, usually over 50% of the students at each grade, already knew the curriculum of the next grade, the very smart ones. So those are things we need to think about as educators. Because when you take somebody in and they're really smart, it doesn't mean that they're ready to do the grade work. It means that they could be ready for, for something different. Then there's also interpersonal reasons for underachievement. Okay? There are kids who are very smart who don't always get along with their teachers. Not supposed to be that way, but it happens. And one of the ways that students can show their independence, show how angry they are, is to do poorly in your class because they don't like you. Okay? The same thing with parents. Sometimes students are angry at their parents. And so if you're smart, what better way to get mom and dad angry than to do poor in school? They're going to be tearing their hair out. Okay? And this happens. And it's not because these students are mean or anything. It's because they're trying to express a frustration. And the way that they can do it is say, if I get bad grades, you're going to pay attention to me. In fact, in groups that we run with parents of underachievers, one of the things we look at is which parent is most upset with the underachievement. If it's mom, then you can bet on it that the real struggle is with mom. If it's dad, then that's where the struggle is. Mm -hmm. There's also an issue of deliberate underachievement. We did this with group work with bright, bright kids. And what they will say is, we know how many good grades we can get before it becomes a problem with our peers. So we deliberately underachieve. We don't get terrible grades, but instead of A, we'll get B. Okay? Because we know that when everybody starts talking about their grades, we don't want to be too high. So we need to understand, we've learned this through, through our interviews. Right? And again, this comes especially in like grades 7, 8, when students are like 13 and 14 years old because they're very, very vulnerable to, to a number of things and relations with peers. A number of years ago, I did a study on perceptions of gifted students, and we asked them a very simple question. Is it a positive? Do you like being gifted? Okay. These were 13, 14, and 15-year-olds because we consider those highly, highly vulnerable years. You're just barely a teen. You're in the middle of everything. Usually by 18, 19, you're, you know, you're becoming more independent. 13, 14, 15. And they said, overwhelmingly, being gifted is good. It's a positive because it helps me understand information. I can figure out what's going on. They also thought it was good because intrapersonally, within, they could think about themselves and think about the world and say, it, I try to make sense of who I am. So they saw that as a plus. 93% of our sample of 154 students okay, said that being gifted was a negative in terms of interpersonal. They believed that being gifted was not appreciated by the others around them. 
Okay? That's a very telling kind of thing if you're 13 or 14 years old. So let me ask you something. What if you knew that there was a quality about you that the other people in this room didn't like? What would you do? Okay? And probably your answer is exactly what they, what they would do is hide it. Because if you know that others in here, you're not going to show it off all the time. Okay? Just, and so that's a lot of what we learned about underachievement. Motivation. This is the one that moms and dads worry about the most, and sometimes teachers, okay? That really the reason for smart kids to get poor grades is because they're lazy, and they just don't want to do the work, okay? What I can tell you in my many years of working with my kids, that may be true, but it's very, 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 very small percentage. Almost all the reasons for underachievement are one of the other kinds of things about curriculum. And so if you, if you have a son or a daughter that you think is underachievement and you're frustrated, I can almost guarantee you that it's not because of laziness, it's because of something else. Okay? These students want to do better, but there are other barriers there. Intrapersonal. You tend to do better work if you think well of yourself, okay? And not all students have a very positive self-concept. So if, for whatever reason, they didn't think well of themselves or they think like, well, I can never be who I should be or my, you know, my parents, my teachers think I, I should do more, when you think poorly of yourself, you tend to also perform poorly. This is also true with athletics. If you have an athlete who loses confidence, who doesn't believe he or she can do well again, they will do poorly. Okay, that's why some athletes fall on the, on the uh, gymnastics bar, they have a bad game, and then next, they come back and they're fine. Other athletes do poorly once or twice, and then they begin to lose confidence, and they never quite you know, regain it. The same thing with self-concept. So it's really important that we not shatter the self-confidence confident, of kids. Perfectionism. This is something that is very unique to high ability students. Some of them see what piano should be played like. Some of them see the way literature should be written. Some of them see the way math should be understood. And they're not happy unless they're perfect. And so because they know they can't be perfect, they'd rather do less. And so perfectionism can actually interfere. That's not the same as laziness. What it says is that they have the ability to see in their mind how it could be, and they know they're not there, and so instead of striving for it, they don't. It's, being perfectionistic is fine, it's just when it interferes with you. And then there's also fear of responsibility. This, it's amazing how, you know, you kind of see contradictions. Some students fear that if I do well, they're going to keep expecting me to do more. So I'm going to cool it. All right? So all of these reasons, they're not always rational. That doesn't, they're not always consistent. doesn't make sense. But they're all understandable when a student is trying to figure out. And when you have high capacity, all of these things make sense. It's like, if I do really well, will I ever be forgiven for not doing well someday? You know, people will say, how could you do so poorly on something? And so again, in a 13, 14, 15 year old mind, it all makes sense. Then there's psych psychological. We didn't know a number of years ago that you could have a disability and still be gifted. Okay, now we call it twice exceptional. We realize that there are many students who have a diagnosed disability, could be on the spectrum, autism, can have a learn, and are still gifted. Okay? In the old days, five, six years ago, in the old days, if you had a disability and you were gifted, the schools dealt with your disability. 
you got put into a resource room. Now things are changing that they're willing to deal with the giftedness because why should you only work on something that needs remedial? Okay? But way back, if you had a disability, that's what triggered the services that, that you would get. Emotional disorders, none of us are freed from, from those kinds of things, you know, anxieties, nervousness. All of those things can interfere with doing well in academic settings, in, in any kind of settings, okay? And especially if you get nervous. There are some kids before major exams, state exams, that just get so nervous and free. They know the thing, but they get so nervous they don't do very, very well. Okay? Other students get so scared that they're not doing well. Same thing. Mental health issues, okay? This is why counselors, psychologists also have to be involved because uh, th these can be fairly difficult issues to overcome. Are they a sign of laziness? No, it's nothing to do with laziness, okay? Do gifted students have learning disabilities? Do they have uh, mental problems? Do they have emotional distresses? Absolutely, okay? They have them the same way that, you know, other people, only it gets accentuated because you say, how can you have such a problem when you're, when you're that smart? This is the one that most people think like, ah, who cares? I care. This is organizational skills. We did some studies with students who were having difficulties in school, and we found is they're disorganized. They're chaotic. Half of them couldn't find their homework in a month, okay? Now, you may say, that's not a big problem. The fact that you're messy, the fact that you can't find things, so what? I've read a book about geniuses, they're that way. But in a school setting, it doesn't always work that way, okay? And if you can't find your work and you can't hand it in, you're probably not going to get a good mark, okay? So I understand these are not big things, but they all contribute to why kids don't have, and, and they don't all have good study habits. You know, some of it, the work comes easy, but then as they move along and things get more difficult, you need some pretty decent study habits, okay? A number of years ago at Stanford University, now Stanford University is really a gifted program in college. It's one of the best universities in America. And so if anyone goes to Stanford, you've done pretty well. The number one course for the first year students in Stanford University was study skills. Because these very bright students from across America got into a much more difficult environment and realized, I don't know how to study, I don't know how to take notes, and, uh, and so that became the most sought the study skills. So again, you know, not a great psychological issue, but they're forward. And as I said, in schools, you know, it, it's an institutional setting. I mean, and I understand we need to, to change schools because schools are not always kind to kids who are smart. But then there has to be some adjustment. So in the long run, does it matter if you do well in school? Okay? And I think for some people, the answer is it really doesn't. You know, who cares? You know, do something else, or we have money, you know. Then. But really, for the most part, it does matter. Because in our society, if you are a great musician, okay, like, you know, Eric was, if you are a great athlete, if your parents have great wealth, you're probably going to do okay anyway. Gotcha. But for about 98% of the population, if they have a very bad school experience, that will close the window about adulthood experience. Okay? So I think we should take a look at the school environment, try to make changes, when some, because it does matter. It's the one thing I feel very, very strongly about when people say, who cares whether you do school? At least for the next two generations, that's where kids go. In America, we have this thing known as homeschooling, but it's less than 1% of America's school uh, students are, are taught at home. 
So 99% go to school. That's where the action is. That's where we need to, to make big changes. Then there's other issues that we've also found interfere with performance. And these are not easy issues. If a student is a drug addict, alcohol, antisocial, gets in trouble with the law, these are usually problems that will need, you know, quite a bit of help, psychological support, family support, and so forth. Okay? I wish I could tell you that no gifted student has ever gotten into drugs. That's not true. Sometimes the reasons for it are different. So these things, they're, they're not free from, from those kinds of issues. So the whole thing with underachievement, a couple of things to leave you with is the difference between I can't do it and I won't do it. Okay? Some of the reasons, uh, like curriculum and so forth, is I really won't do it because it's so, so boring. I'm going to give you an example about curriculum that's at a pace. You may be familiar with Johns Hopkins University. It's a very major university in the United States. And they have done a lot with gifted students over the generations. And they did some experiments with gifted. So what they did was students in grade 7 who had never taken Algebra 1, and for us, Algebra 1 is the introduction to algebra, the first real abstract notion of, of math. Never taken Algebra 1, but they were bright. Completed a competency exam in Algebra 1 after just three weeks of instruction. Okay? However, the school year in the United States is 184 days. So think about this for a second. You can complete something in three weeks, but we ask you to do over 184 days wow, what, what's going to happen there? Okay. I can tell by the looks on your faces you don't fully get it. So let me bring it close to home. I'm about to finish my talk. You've heard what I have to say. You figured it out. What if I asked you to come back another 183 days to hear the same thing and learn it? Okay. Think about how you would be behaving on day 78. Okay? You would not be sitting there the way you're sitting now. Most of you would be totally disengaged, and you would not look very intelligent to me because you just can't take it. It's so out of whack. You would be disengaged, and whenever you're disengaged, we all lose. Others of you, and I think I know who you are, would start acting out. You would start misbehaving because you just couldn't take it. And this is what happens to some of our very, very bright students in schools that don't know how to make the adjustment. They either disengage or sometimes they misbehave. And does it matter? It sure does. Okay, because every time we lose a bright student, we all lose. And so it means a lot to change the environment, to work with the student. But you need to understand the responsibility for problem. It's not always the student's fault. The curriculum, the environment. Eric, yesterday talked about the importance of flexibility. How many times have we said to somebody, no, you can't do that. Why not? It's the rules. Come on. Think bigger. Use your heart bigger. It's your son or daughter. Okay? And bright students need a little bit more flexibility. We don't have to remove them from school. We can make some of those changes right in schools. So, problems, the curriculum. Yes, we can work one-on-one, -on -one, we can do group work and so forth, but where we can probably have some of the biggest impact is by changing the atmosphere of school. By just realizing that if we are too constricted, okay, we're shattering the, the flower that, that's trying to bloom. Okay? These kids are not born disliking school. It happens gradually whenever we don't recognize what they are. So if I can leave you with anything, think about 78 where you're sitting and how you would feel. 
don't, don't ever let anybody feel that day 78 we can avoid it. And you as a teacher have a tremendous impact because they need guidance. They may be smart, but they're still immature. They need someone to say, I trust you, I believe in you, we can do this. Thank you very much.